The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. Rotation is the word they use. Touchdown tornado. It was coming directly for our house. And she's scrambling for cover. She started describing that the pressure changed and that it's here. A survival. I heard my wife screaming. From the center of the storm. The door smashing and the glass breaking. Our seven days ablaze continues. I remember just screaming Jesus. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Dinosaurs used to roam the earth. They don't do it anymore. Something happened to kill them off 66 million years ago. We're going to be telling you about that. But first, our economic house is on fire. The budget deficit breaking a trillion dollar mark and climbing. Yet no surprise here, Democrats still beating the drum for impeachment. Capitol Hill reporter Abigail Robertson has more on the crippling dysfunction in Congress. Republican Representative Doug Collins is criticizing House Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler for preparing a vote on impeachment proceedings, calling the Democrats' continued push for impeachment pitiful. They know they don't have the votes to go for a full formal impeachment inquiry, which is what our House rules require. Adding he believes Democrats are changing the rules. They want to make it look like they're doing something they promised their base because they've been out promising that they would get this president. The sad part about it is, is they want uh, they want people to believe something that's not true. They want to continue to put a false narrative out there. Congress also faces only three weeks to strike a deal on government funding. While the Senate plans to work on passing appropriations bills, House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer wrote to his colleagues that he's disappointed that the Senate failed to introduce a single appropriations bill for the first time in more than three decades, concluding that a continuing resolution will be necessary to prevent another government shutdown. Two issues that could complicate budget deals, border wall funding and gun control, with even Republican Senator Roy Blunt concerned over the president using money from his national emergency declaration to build the wall. I think what the president's doing is the right thing to do, but I think if you take away that congressional ability to decide how money is spent, you really take away the biggest tool that Congress has in the unique balance of power our Constitution creates. After 53 people died from mass shootings in the U.S. in August, Democrats are returning to Washington with a priority on gun control. Enough is enough. Congress is returning to session, and our first order of business in the Senate should be to pass the House Passed Bipartisan Background Checks Act. From a policy perspective, we must close the loophole in our background check system to make other gun safety laws effective. Democrats on the 2020 campaign trail are echoing that call. Gun violence is literally life and death. That has become so numbingly common that we have kids going to school wondering if they're going to be physically safe. And with the growing deficit and debt still not under control, Trump now has another 2020 challenger from his own party. We're headed toward the most predictable financial crisis in the history of our country, and we've never been as financially vulnerable, save for the start of our republic, the Civil War, and World War II. I can't sit on the sidelines and not speak up, and all of us should find a way to make our voices heard. Former South Carolina Governor and Congressman Mark Sanford says his campaign will focus on fiscal responsibility, but Republicans in many states, including South Carolina, voted to eliminate their primaries, making his candidacy a long shot. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. I don't understand uh, why some uh, uh, Democrat is calling on the Senate to propose a spending bill. That's supposed to be the province of the House of Representatives. That's where fiscal bills are supposed to originate. But we told you at the top of the show how the deficit federal spending is out of control. Here's more. The government's total debt is now more than $22 trillion. That's bigger than our gross domestic product. And net interest payments on the debt is estimated to be $332 million billion this fiscal year. Stephen Moore is an economist with the Heritage Foundation. 
He joins us from our Washington bureau. And uh, Steve, why doesn't the Congress do something about this deficit? It, instead of talking about impeachment and gun control and all this stuff. <clears throat> Well, Pat, you said it well, uh, that, that federal spending is out of control, and that is a truism in Washington. And I hate to tell you this, Pat, because I know, you're, you, know you ran for Republican uh, president. Uh, the Republicans are just as responsible for these big deficits as the Democrats are, <laughs> because it turns out politicians love to play Santa Claus. And so we now have a situation, Pat, where the Democrats want to spend more money on social programs, the Republicans want to spend more money on the military, so they spend more and more on each. Now, I want to be clear on one point, though. I think this is really important, Pat. It is not a revenue problem. If you look at what happened, even after the uh, Trump tax cuts, which I think really rejuvenated the American economy, in 2018 and 2019, as you know, the fiscal year for 2019 uh, ends on October 1st, the federal tax revenues we're at an all-time high. Never before in the history of this country have we had higher tax revenues than in 2018 and in 2019. So that tells me, Pat, it is not a revenue problem. It's not the tax cuts. It's that neither party wants to do anything to cut out-of-control government spending. Uh, Steve, you, you wrote a column in the Wall Street Journal recently saying that the government should uh, refinance debt while those mm -hmm. interest rates are so low. Tell us more about that. Well, first of all, Pat, Think about, you know, you showed those frightening numbers on the screen a minute ago about how big our debt is and that, that the debt is larger than our GDP. I mean, that's a frightening thing to think about. I mean, I remember when I first came to town, you know, we had $100 billion deficits. Now we have trillion dollar deficits. I mean, it is, it is an outrage. Now, I will say this, though, that think of how big our debt would be if interest rates went back. Do you remember, Pat, in the 1970s when we had, you know, 15, 16 percent interest rates. Remember that under Jimmy Carter? I mean, imagine we moved towards anywhere near interest rates as they've been in the past, you know, six, even six, seven, eight percent interest rates. The debt, the burden of paying for that debt would be enormous. So what I'm saying is while we have these lowest in history uh, interest rates, the interest rate on the 10 year Treasury bill is now one and a half percent. 30 year Treasury bills at two percent. Let's lock those low interest rates in and, and issue 30, even 50 year bonds so that we're not susceptible to a giant increase in, in interest rates that would send our debt even uh, even more into the stratosphere. Uh, uh, if we flood the market, I mean, can the market sustain that kind of uh, well, uh, issue of by the federal uh, by that's the Treasury? A good that's a good question. We don't know for sure. Uh, let's try it and see. You know, there's other countries. I think Austria is one of them. Austria has a 100-year bond out there, Pat. I don't know if you bought any of those. 100-year <laughs> bonds. At a, you know what the interest rate on that is? 1% per year. So there's Incredible. so much risk aversion out there by investors. Yeah, I do think people would buy up these bonds. Look, the safest investment in the world still is buying, you know, other than buying gold, is buying a U.S. Treasury bill. So, yeah, I do think there's the demand out there. You've got right now, you're not going to believe this, Pat. You've got something like $10 trillion out there in the world economy of bonds at negative interest rates. You heard me right. Negative Unbe interest rates. People are buying bonds at rates it's, it's unbelievable. Now, that, that is why I think you know, the United States could do this. I don't know if we're going to get negative rates, but I think we could get a low interest rate on those bonds, and that would help over the next 20 or 30 years save a couple trillion dollars. And even in Washington, that's real money. What's going to move the economy to do that? I mean, you're close to those fellows. I mean, don't you think the president ought to take the lead on that? Well, I th you know, uh, thanks to my uh, op-ed piece that you mentioned in the Wall Street Journal, the Treasury is getting on this, and, and they're certainly going to issue more long-term debt, which is a good thing. People don't realize, j just take a wild guess at what the average turnover is on that $22 trillion debt. Mm. Well, uh, our economy five, is Five and a half years. Uh, 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 five and a half years. So, you know, let, let's increase that, that 15 or 20 years and we lock in those low rates. But, but that's only part of the solution. You know, the big part of the solution, I'm going to throw one out there for you, uh, Pat. It's something that Donald Trump has talked about. You, have you heard of the penny plan? Yeah. Go ahead. Let's do that. I mean, it's so simple. You just, for those who have not heard of it, it's just for every dollar we spend in Washington, next year, instead of that agency spending a dollar, 
they spend 99 cents. So they cut one penny. And the next year, they spend one penny less. And the next year, they spend one penny less. Now, this is Washington that wastes about 25 cents of every dollar they spend. Don't you think maybe they could suck in their stomach, tighten their belts, and save a penny every year on they spend? And by the way, that may not seem like a lot of savings. But, Pat, if you do that for five years, you've cut the deficit in half just by cutting that penny a year. Incredible. Why not do that? Incredible. Well, you, you remember the old uh, Roosevelt uh, mantra, uh, it's tax and tax and spend and spend, and that's the way they got elected. Do, do you think any uh, congressman is going to get elected because he says, I've cut the deficit? <laughs> Well, you know, that's a good question. I, look, I, I, I don't want to be too negative here. I mean, you're right. This debt is out of control. I'm so glad you've put a siren alarm out there about this debt because nobody in Washington wants to talk about this because, as I said, both parties are in on this. Both parties are. But yeah, on the other hand, Pat, this economy is doing really well. If you're an American worker, in your and my lifetime, there has never been a time, a better time to be looking for a job than right now. Did you know, Pat, we have 7.3 million unfilled jobs in America. That's more jobs unfilled than the entire population of the state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a robust labor market. Donald Trump has done a great job of creating the jobs this economy needs. Wages are rising. The average American income is up $4,000 a year. Uh, since Trump took office. Uh, I love this picture. We have the low, and you know what I love most about this, Pat? Mm. The lowest black and the lowest Hispanic unemployment rate ever since we started keeping these records. <laughs> Amazing. Well, <laughs> you, let me ask you about it. There are a lot of these uh, nations, especially in Europe and around the world, they're in serious trouble. Are they going to drag us hey. down, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, this is something that's keeping me up at night, uh, that, that the rest of the world, Europe is flat. Their economies aren't growing. Germany is actually in a recession. Japan's kind of flat. China, there was a big article in the Wall Street Journal the other day. China, you know, lies about their economic statistics. They're saying they're growing at 7%. A lot of economists think their economy is actually contracting. So it's a global economy. And, and guess, by the way, best, guess what country of all the industrialized countries today, Pat, is doing the best? Yeah. Like the U.S. of A. Right? <laughs> you better believe it. <laughs> They're all looking over here saying, how did he do that? I want whatever he's doing because it's working. <laughs> and uh, we got to get this trade deal done with China. And my prediction to you, Pat, if we get this trade deal signed, sealed, and delivered, and I happen to support what Trump is doing, and it's slowed down the economy a little bit, but this is a tough fight we have with China, and they're a bad actor. They're, we're, they're a menace now on the global scene. If we can get a trade deal done with China, I think you're going to see the American economy. It's going to be take, like taking a champagne bottle shaking it up and taking the cork off of it. So, and that happens, you know, in 2020, we'll have a strong economy. And I don't care if it's Mark Sanford or I don't care if it's, you know, Elizabeth Warren. I don't care if it's Mother Teresa. They're not going to beat Donald Trump in a strong economy. I love it. Stephen Moore, <laughs> thank you, my friend, for joining us. That's great. Well, okay, in yeah, other yeah. news, North Carolina holds a special election today, and the outcome could hold a clue to President Trump's chances. Ephraim Graham has more on our top stories from CBN News. Here's Ephraim. Pat, voters in North Carolina go to the polls today to fill a vacant congressional seat. It's a tight race viewed by some as a referendum on President Donald Trump's job performance. The president also knows North Carolina is an important state for him to win if he is to be reelected in 2020. He was in Fayetteville Monday evening in a final push to rally the troops. He reminded voters what he feels is at stake, not only for the 9th Congressional District, but also for the nation. The radical Democrats want to dismantle, demolish, and destroy everything that you've gained. And they will do it, and it won't take that long. North Carolina's 9th District is traditionally Republican, but one recent poll shows Democrat Dan McCready leading Republican Dan Bishop by four percentage points. Back to you, Pat. Well, more setbacks for British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. For the second time, Parliament rejected his call for a general election after lawmakers uh, blocked his bid to leave the European Union in October. Now, without a deal, the new law prevents the UK from leaving the U uh, EU without an agreement covering trade, travel, and other matters. Johnson says he prefers an agreement but we'll leave without one. Parliament will not meet again until mid-October. The legislative body was suspended at Johnson's request. 
Pat, it is a discovery that has the scientific world talking, evidence of the last days of the dinosaurs captured in prehistoric limestone. According to National Geographic, scientists say they found limestone capturing the moment 66 million years ago when an asteroid crashed just offshore of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. X-ray imaging and other methods revealing evidence of massive destruction, including wildfires and massive tsunamis triggered by its impact and foreshadowing the dinosaurs' eventual extinction. One theory is the impact of the asteroid vaporized sulfur-bearing rocks blotting out the sun and causing global cooling that devastated all kinds of living things. Pat, sound familiar? Thank you very much. And folks, uh, as much as uh, I don't like to criticize other people, I do think this idea that the Earth has been around for 6,000 years is just nonsense. I mean, this was 66 million years and we had dinosaurs and they were there. And now they're not there anymore because of that extincture. And that's one of the dangers that we always face. The uh, air around us is filled with all of these rocks, and all they are is just lifeless rocks, but they're big and they can hurt us. And uh, when Jesus talked about the end of the age, I wrote a book called The End of the Age, and it talked about the fact that of an of a, uh, asteroid hitting Earth. And it wouldn't have to be a big one. Mine was, uh, well, it was six-tenths of a mile, one kilometer, and it was enough to cause global destruction. So. The thing that we've got Jupiter out there is a great big planet that sucks in a lot of these things that would, would hit Earth ordinarily. God has spared this Earth, but all it would take is one of them, just one of them to, to you know, they call some of them called extinctors that would wipe out life on Earth. The one that hit the dinosaurs wiped out li life on Earth and then it finally came back. But the one I had in my book, The End of the Age, was six tenths of a mile. It was, you know, so many billion pounds, and it came roaring down. And uh, it doesn't take much, but we are so vulnerable. That's why we need to pray and ask. Uh, we, we, the mercy of God is keeping this planet alive. Terry? Well, still to come, boom times in oil country, roughnecks out for something far more precious than black gold. What are they really searching for? And also in the Lone Star State, a Texas-sized twister. Explosive sounds all around this woman right before the killer storm suddenly sucked her right out of her house. You can't imagine how she survived. That's later on today's show. Well, the U.S. is now an energy superpower thanks to a place in Texas known as the Permian Basis. It's a remote region in the Texas desert. Oil production in the Permian has exploded, along with the population of people coming in to work in the oil industry. And now something unusual is being stockpiled near the behemoth of black gold. And you'll never guess what it is. Here's Heather Sills with the intriguing details. Right here in the middle of a scorching desert, oil is fueling a population boom. The Permian Basin is leading the U.S. in oil and gas production right now, but believers here say they see a spiritual potential in these fields that is more strategic than the oil and gas. Pastor Jesse Gore has ministered in Odessa for decades. All factors indicate that we're going to double in just a few short years. Uh, so we're looking at a huge uh, influx of people coming in. Oil man Damian Barrett is literally stockpiling Bibles in a small trailer outside of Midland. They've come in from all over the country, and there's even some that have come in from out of the country just to work here because we're booming right now. It's, it's just a crazy time here in Midland, Texas. Part of that craziness is workers on the job 24-7. It's a tough population to reach with the gospel. The schedule's about 80 hours a week. Uh, so uh, when you think about that kind of workload, after an eventual period of time, that can really take a toll mentally, physically, spiritually. Gore and Barrett are just two of those with a vision for reaching this population. Barrett stockpiles these Bibles to give away as part of the Oilfield Christian Fellowship. 
if you were to just want to go out to a rig and hand them Bibles, you really couldn't do that. So you almost need to be in the oil field to do it. He and other believers here are distributing Bibles however they can. One has connected with the so-called man camps, where thousands of workers live. Others work special events like the annual International Oil Show, while others hand them out at work. Gore is finding an in with oil workers by accommodating to their schedules. He organizes Bible studies around lunch, one of the few times workers can take a break. This former safety professional also offers his services free to area companies as long as he gets the last word. I tell him I get the last 10 minutes to tell him about who changed my life. And so I get to, to get to evangelize. These opportunities are leading to some sweet gospel stories. One came after a worker dropped off Bibles at a local business. The guy came back to the used car dealer and said, man, I can't tell you thank you enough. I went home last night, read all of the Gospel of John. My wife did the same thing. We both got on our knees right there in the house and prayed and accepted Christ as our Savior, and we're changed. A payoff even better than the rich flow of oil and gas in this remote Texas desert. Reporting in the Permian Basin, Heather Sells, CBN News. There's never a place where you can't take the gospel. That is such good news. Terry? Well, coming up at night, you may be sleeping on the creation of a former crack addict. 30 million of us already are. See if you're one of them. That's just ahead. And the riveting story of a mom caught in a killer tornado. The horrendous monster shredded her home and almost sucked the life out of her. What saved her? Well, that's next. Well, we are in day two of our annual Seven Days Ablaze celebration. Throughout this week, our campus gathers together for a dynamic time where we pray for you, our partners. Yesterday, Gordon Robertson kicked off the event. We all know the power of life and death is in the tongue, but you can't prophesy without announcing it. You can't have a miracle without praying out loud. God does not necessarily respond to the meditations and the secret wishes within your heart. He's looking for you to act. He's looking for you to announce it. So. It's a twofold thing, I believe, therefore I spoke. And it's when those two things line up that an incredible miracle power gets released. It's what's coming out of your mouth that is determining. It's the certainty in your heart and then speaking it forth that causes these things to happen. It causes mountains to move. Well, we're going to be praying for your prayer requests in just a few moments. If any of you have a need and you want us to pray for you, let us know. Our number is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000 or you can visit CBN.com. You can also mail your request to Seven Days Ablaze. Some of you have already received the mailing that you see right there. Our address here, if you haven't mailed yours in yet, is CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. And uh, you can call, as I said, if you didn't get the mailer, then we'd still love to hear from you because it is our privilege to pray for you. And so please let us hear. And we've got a great answer to prayer yes, coming up do. right now. Yes, sir. Tornadoes, nature's most brutal storms. Earlier this year, a monster tornado slammed down in Texas, demolishing everything in its path. This terrifying twister shredded the house of a woman named Jan Como when she was all alone inside her house. I knew there were a possibility of severe storms that were coming, but no idea what the effect of, of those were gonna be. You know, you go your whole life going through bad storms, especially living in a place like Texas. The forecast for Dan and Jen Como's area called for severe weather, as it had the prior weekend. Jen planned to be at home while her husband went to weekend reserve duty five hours away. The kids went with him to visit nearby family. I wasn't too worried about it. I was just, okay, well, you know, it'll rain hard, it'll wind will blow, 
Okay. Jen wasn't concerned either, until after Dan left. Then, she felt a stirring in her spirit. I heard the Lord just impart to me, I need you to pray over these storms. And so I did. I listened to that and I prayed over that and sang his praises and anointed the house. The forecast, showers and thunderstorms today with strong... The next morning, Jen kept an eye on the weather reports. I saw as the radar started tracking another storm coming through, I started to get a little concerned that it was getting so close. So she called Dan. I was at reserve drill on Saturday, and she said, you might want to look at the weather report. I'm a little concerned. And so I pulled it up on my phone, and the radar was not looking good. Rotation is the word they used. In fact, a funnel cloud had been spotted near the Comos town. The last thing I wanted her was in a vehicle and a storm bearing down on top of her. So I felt like the safest place was in our home. OK. Dogs cared for, check. Flashlight, check. Cell phone, check. Jen prepared while she took several more calls from concerned friends. Then came the warning. A tornado had hit downtown Alto, just one mile from their home. It was coming directly for our house. So yeah, I started getting nervous. And so was Dan. He called Jen again, who by now had crated the dogs and taken cover in their bedroom closet. A sudden stillness came over the house. You could feel that the tornado was there. You could sense that it was there without seeing out of the door. And then I just started praying. She started describing that the pressure changed and that it's here. The Holy Spirit just put Psalm 91 in my mind. I pulled it up on my phone right there while I was talking to her, and I just started reading it with authority. He shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. Then that's when I heard the door smashing and the glass breaking all around me. And it wasn't just breaking, it was exploding. And my ears were popping, and the pressure changed in the entire environment. Louder than anything was the sound of all the timber cracking around the house. It sounded like a thousand toothpicks being snapped. I could hear my house being shredded over the phone, you know, and I heard my wife screaming and I heard the dogs barking. Never have I felt so helpless in my entire life. I was terrified. <laughs> I remember just screaming, Jesus. I can remember almost as the words came out, I was being tumbled out of the house. It was that quickly. Then all Dan could hear was complete silence. And I was just shouting, trying to get her to respond. Honey, are you OK? Answer me. Finally, in a very faint distance, I heard, I think it was my wife, shouting, help. So at that point, the hardest decision I had to make was to hang up so I could start calling people to come help us. Dan got a hold of friends from church who rushed right over to try to find Jen. This experience put me in a position of just complete and utter vulnerability and dependency on everybody else in God's kingdom to actually come in and to do things that I was just completely incapable of doing at that moment. Boy, did they show up. The Como home was demolished, but Jen was only bruised, and the dogs were fine too. She walked out to the road, flagged down a driver, and got to the hospital to be checked over. On the way, she used a phone to call Dan. Within 20 minutes, she walked away with this, with a little bump on the head and a little bit of road rash. The friends from church brought her home and started salvaging what they could from the wreckage. Them taking care of her and being there allowed me the ability to, you know, get there and, and not panic for five hours straight. We just walked up to each other, embraced, and it was just, we were whole again, you know? Now all settled in another home. The Como say God's word and prayer have new meaning for them. And I've never been more scared in my life, but also more sure in my life that I was going to be protected. The power of prayer is our prayers are real, and what we say matters. He's always listening. He's always there, and he always answers. Everything in the Bible is absolutely real. 
He deserves every bit of praise and every bit of glory and every bit of honor for everything he has done for me before, during, and after this storm. Well, the Lord will protect you in the midst of storm. The 91st Psalm, you know, a thousand will follow you side and 10,000 is your right hand and it won't come nigh you because that's what the Lord will take care of. Well, we've got some prayer requests, so what do you have? People with great needs. This yeah. is somebody saying, I need to be healed of multiple sclerosis and the blindness it has caused. Someone else saying, healing of my right knee so the total knee replacement on September 25th can be canceled. Here's a prayer for God's divine protection from their ex-husband threatening to destroy her. Oh, my. And then the Lord's wisdom and financial blessing on their business. So people needing God. Here's one. A person has a traumatic brain injury and said, please pray for me. There's somebody that says the Lord would heal America, that we'd be one nation under God. What a wonderful prayer request that is. And uh, here's one that says that the Lord would restore love and respect in our marriage. Mm. And finally, this one I've got is, uh, I think, uh, there, healing of an inoperable tumor in my spinal cord. Now, folks, we have, as in front of us, if I can have the camera there, we have thousands of requests that are coming in. I don't know what the exact number is, but it could be in the tens of thousands of people who say, I. Please pray for me. Please pray for me. Because God himself hears the prayers of his people. And Terry and I are going to join hands together with you. And people are praying all over this nation. And we're going to believe God for you. Because with God, all things are possible. So we join together. Father, I join with my sister in Christ. And may the power of the Holy Spirit come now into people's lives. May they see your anointing. May you see your blessing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And that inoperable spinal condition, we speak to the Word of yes. God in Jesus' name. Be touched. Terry. Yeah, I believe that thing is just going just as unusually and quickly as it came. It's going to shrivel up and be gone. There will be no damage to your spine, to your ability to function. It will just simply be gone in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. Someone, you have an ongoing injury in your right wrist. It's so uncomfortable for you to do the simple things of life. Take off a Tupperware jar, turn the key in your vehicle. Everything just inflamed, that thing is inflamed. God is healing that for you right now. All of that swelling, all of that um, painfulness, that ache is going to be gone. You're going to have full mobility. There's a tumor in, in your abdomen. It's like a big balloon. And you put your hand there in the name of Jesus and speak the word that shall decline, decrease, and be healed in Jesus' name. Now, Father, all across this nation, people are praying, and they were saying, let there be one nation under God. Lord, this nation needs you. We need you, Lord, and we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you may come in and touch lives and heal, Lord, this Amen. land. In Jesus' name we ask it. Let there be a spirit of revival in America, we pray. In your holy name, amen. Amen. And amen. Mm -hmm. Terry. I just want people to know that you can always yeah. call us for prayer. Our, not, our prayer lines are always open. It's toll free, 1-800-700-7000. And we'll be continuing to pray for those of you who sent in your requests throughout this week. Well, still to come, a junkie so high, his crack dealer staged an intervention. And get this, he stayed awake for 19 days straight. Now, this man has helped millions of Americans get their best sleep ever. You're going to see why it's all coming up. And then later, your questions and some honest answers. My son's wife left him. Now he wants to take his life. What can we do to help him? Pat's going to weigh in on that and so much more. Don't go away. We'll be back.
And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The U.S. Coast Guard says all members of a cargo ship that overturned and caught fire off the coast of Georgia are now safe and accounted for. Coast Guard video captured the moment yesterday. Officials rescued the four crew members that were trapped inside. Rescue teams were battling extreme temperatures, topping what felt like 120 degrees on the hot hull of the tanker. Officials say the men are in fairly good condition considering what they've been through. There were 20 other crew members on board the Golden Ray when it capsized, but those members were rescued immediately. Archaeologists say they have discovered the true location of Emmaus. The gospel tells us Jesus appeared to two of his followers on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection. A Franco-Israeli team has been excavating a hill overlooking Jerusalem known as Kiryath Yerim since 2017. Tel Aviv University archaeologists told Haaretz the importance of this site, its dominant position over Jerusalem, was felt again and again through time in the 8th century BCE, and then again in the Hellenistic period, and then again after the first Jewish revolt and the sack of Jerusalem in 70 CE. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Well, you'd have to live on another planet not to have heard about my pillow. Over 30 million of them have been sold, and the infomercial behind them is number one in the world. What you might not know, where did the idea for my pillow come from? Mike Lindell, founder and CEO of My Pillow, has sold over 30 million pillows. Yet during the early days of the company, Mike was hiding a horrible secret. He was a crack cocaine addict. In 2009, Mike prayed to God for help and surrendered his life to Christ. His desire to use drugs was taken away. Today, he uses his platform to help others find freedom from addiction and freedom in Christ. My pillows, Mike Lindell is here with us now. Welcome to the 700 Club. Thanks Mike, for having me on. Here. <laughs> this is awesome. But we're kind of neighbors. You're Minnesota. I'm from Wisconsin, so I recognize the accent. I right. know you don't think you have one, but you do. Yeah. We well, say <laughs> wash instead of wash. <laughs> That's right. Well, you have such an interesting history. You're a college dropout. You got canned from a grocery store where you worked. Decades hooked on drugs. Hardly someone that's the picture of a potential success story. How did this all happen? Well, it's, uh, I mean, it was all God, and uh, I think God was chasing me throughout my life, even when I had, uh, I used to have a bar, I had a bar for 13 years, not a good place for an addict, and, but I was, uh, I was, uh, it goes back to, you know, um, when I was um, seven years old, my parents divorced, I was put into a new school, and I was actually shy, I was actually, would do, I would do stuff, uh, I wouldn't talk to people, if you didn't, you know, you don't get rejected if you don't talk to people, right. or I would show off, like, jump out of a moving bus window and things like that, you know, <laughs> hey, watch this. And, Something small. <laughs> and, uh, but then I, I got into cocaine, I was a very functioning cocaine addict for years, um, and I, I did have a... Uh, um, we were, my, it was Mary. We had four kids, and and uh, we were. Uh, you know, addiction affects everyone, not just yeah. people that are homeless and lonely out there. They, uh, I, I say it before, addiction affects all of us, no matter how many forks we eat with. Yes. And but I had the I had the these bars, and and uh, not a good place for an addict. And and uh, but I was always an entrepreneur. And then when I in, invented my pillow. Um, I was turned down everywhere. And about that same time, a couple of years prior to that, I got into crack cocaine. Wow. And um, with crack, it's very paranoid drug, and you're, and, uh, you're staring out windows, and you're, you're doing, uh, it's not a very social drug at all. And So you were already into the, or maybe I should say still in the cocaine when my pillow was first invented, yeah. Started. When I, when I, uh, when I got that dream from God, it was, uh, um, and, by, and by the way, what you asked me before, when I was, when I would be in bar, at the bar after, you know, afterwards, we'd all go out to party or whatever, and I would, I would be telling my friends, I'd say, you know, we got to quit this, and I would tell them about the Bible I read about when I was in jail and stuff, you know, and they, uh, and they would quit that day and find, find the Lord, and I'm going, what did I say? I'm losing friends, you know, so it was, <laughs> but I would be talking, trying to talk them, you know, talk mm -hmm. myself into it, and, but I, when I invented my pillow, 
it was uh, the same time I was a full-blown crack addict, but I put everything into the kind of shifted my addiction over here. You know, I'm inventing my, my son and I would sit out on our deck every day and tear different foams are flying around the neighborhood and and uh, we wouldn't give up. And finally, we had the pillow invented. It took about nine, ten months, and I was turned down everywhere. So wow. it was a complete shutout. There, you know, box stores and shopping channels and. And someone said, well, Mike, why don't you do a kiosk? I said, how do you spell kiosk, you know? <laughs> and I, uh, but I didn't give up and I, and we did a, we did a, that kiosk and, and people, I couldn't talk to people because they, you know, that was, uh, you know, it's like head, you know, sure. one on one. And, but I worked like one of those days and a guy came up and bought a pillow from me. And it was uh, that, selling that first pillow was just amazing. There was nothing, no feeling like that in the world. <laughs> and he buys this pillow and he says, you have a business card. I go, I'm all out. <laughs> and, uh, and I wrote it up, wrote my name on a number on a piece of paper. I didn't have business cards. And, and, but I was completely broke. And uh, we had a mortgage house to buy Christmas presents that year, borrow wow. money anyway. And that guy that I had been there that one day, he called me in January and said, are you the guy that invented this pillow? He's from Minnesota here. He said, this changed my life. It created a miracle in my life. And, I'm, and that was a divine appointment. He says, I run the Minneapolis Home and Garden Show. Would you like to do, wow. uh, come in my show? There wow. I put up a booth and I could actually talk to people because uh, there was a booth, you know, a table between us. And I'd step out behind it. I couldn't talk. I'd step back here and I could talk. But God did one thing there. He brought people back the next day. And I mean, in the droves, they just kept coming and they're going, I tried this pill and it, it changed my life. And that made me feel good inside. It wasn't about the money. It was about helping people. But it gave me, gave me some that, self-worth, yes. you know. Yeah. I think so many people don't have that self-worth, you know. You are entrepreneurial by nature. I mean, this wasn't your first venture, but you mentioned the dream. Talk about the dream that started this. Yeah, I had, you know, I had the dream and it was actually the name, my pillow first. There was really? no mys and, and, I, and I got up and all over the house I wrote my pillow I'm going I was all excited and, and you know I always had problems with pillows they don't go flat and all these right. you know I'd, all the way back to I was 16 years old but I wrote my pillow all over the house and one of my daughters came upstairs and she's like 11 or 12 she goes what are you doing? It's like two in the morning. I go, I'm going to invent this pillow. It's, I've had this dream. It's going to be called my pillow and it's going to be able to adjust. I'm telling her all this. And she grabbed her glass of water and she, she looked, she goes, that's really random dad and headed back downstairs. <laughs> and, uh, but it, but the dreams kept coming and, uh, you know, they, um, and, you know, we'd get to a point, you know, for washing and drying and I have a dream and it was all theory. It was funny. The, the, um, the one time this, uh, this guy came up at the at the state fair when I was there the first year, and he says, "Are you the guy that invented this pillow?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Well, this will never see big retail ever." He said, "Have you ever heard the cars that got twenty or two hundred miles a gallon? You don't hear about them." And I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Well, we tested this, and it lasts ten years." And I, well, I'm glad somebody did because mine was all just dreams from God, and. Uh, so each year that went by, I'm going, we're getting closer to the, you know, to the warranty, you know, and, and all these, but they, it was just a lot of divine appointments. And then throughout those seven years, you know, I was turned down everywhere. And then I ended up doing home shows and fairs, mm -hmm. but I lost a, a 20 year marriage. I had people wow. taking the company. I had all these things happening and, uh, and the pillow company was just a little pulse just a little, you know, heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And in the spring of 2008, I actually had drug dealers do an intervention on me. Wow. And in Minneapolis, there was three of them and they, 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 I come out and they go, yeah, yeah, Mike's been up for 14 days and uh, we're, everybody's cutting him off. And, and uh, two of them left and the one guy, he stayed up and he see how many, how much crack I had left. And he ended up going to sleep. It was 2.30 in the morning and I was out and I went down to the streets of Minneapolis and, and he, um, I come back up there an hour later, I couldn't get crack anywhere. And he's standing up for me, he goes, he said, how'd that work out for you? He goes, give me that phone, I'm taking a picture of you, you're gonna need it for your book. He said, you've been telling us for years that this pillow company is just a platform for God and you're gonna come back and help us all someday and we're not gonna let you die on us. And this is what I would tell them all back then. It would, I'd get these dreams, these prophetic dreams of coming back and helping uh, Boy, you know, and you addicts. have built this company into uh, just a, a huge company. Now you've got sheets, you 
you've got uh, all kinds toppers, of yeah. toppers yeah. that you're doing with yeah, it. Yeah, and so it's, uh, it, it's rewarding for me. It's, you know, it keeps, it keeps me out there in the public eye so I can use this for my evangelism, for ministry and helping addicts. And I've got over 1,500 employees now, and we're like a big family. Well, we're a company of second chances. When I first went from five employees to 540 days, back when I did my first infomercial, Everyone's going, Mike, you need to have a, a corporate attorney. You need to be CEO and you need an HR department. I said, those things sound horrible. I want to make pillows, you know? <laughs> yes, and you have. And so. you've done it. That's what people see in your commercials, the realness of you, but these people all working together that are smiling and yeah. looking like they're having uh. fun. want to say, we have touched the surface of Mike's story. His book, What Are the Odds, comes out in December, but you can pre-order a copy today. He's also going to be our featured speaker in today's Seven Days of Blaze Chapel, and you can stream that event live on CBN.com. That's at noon Eastern time. You don't want to miss it. So great to meet you in person. Thank you for being here. So oh, it's it's an amazing story uh, of what been, God has done. I just yeah. want to hope the story brings people hope, and I just yeah. want to, you know, with God, all things are possible. Amen, brother. <laughs> well, still to come, time to tackle your email questions. Josh says, I keep having abusive, terrible thoughts about God. How do I stop? Pat's got some honest answers to your questions, and it's all next, so don't go away. for your questions and some honest answers. Pat, this first one comes from Josh, who says, I keep having terrible thoughts towards God, abusive, terrible thoughts. I'm always very sorry after, but I don't like having these thoughts toward God, my Savior. What can I do to stop this? Um, I, I think thoughts like that are, sound like they're demonic. I, you know, Satan hates God, and only Satan would put thoughts like that in your mind. Um, so I think what you need to do is rebuke that thing. Uh, I bind you, Satan, in, in, in the power of evil, and I command you to leave me. And at the same time, focus your mind on what God has done. Think of the glory of the Lord. Think of the fact that you're alive in America. Think of the fact that you have a family. Think about the fact that you have health. Think about the fact you've got enough food to eat. Go down the list. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one, as the song goes. Mm -hmm. Do that. And then keep letting those things fill your life. But that, that does sound that those thoughts just don't spring from human emotion. I think it's, it's more serious than that. All right? Mm -hmm. This is Lois who says, my son is saved. His wife left him with their baby and the RV. He's been waiting and waiting about nine months. He's down so deep now, he's ready to take his life. His dad and I have been praying with him and at home. We need to see a miracle for their marriage. What can we do to help? We are praying. Um, I, I think in that case, he needs what's called an intervention. He really does. Uh, th this is ridiculous that uh, his wife l left him, and he's got a baby. And He's and been waiting nine months. Been waiting. I mean, I don't know what he's waiting for. Well, hopefully for, them, for the whole thing to be restored. I well, think. big deal. Well, anyhow... I, I just really think that uh, what you need to do is to get people surrounding him, because he, if, if he keeps this up, he'll be suicidal. And you need to get people with him right now, right now, to talk to him. And he needs to talk this thing out, talk it out, talk it out, and, and make a show of them openly, the Bible says. Okay. Okay, this is a viewer who says, I think it's very discouraging that Pat said, God doesn't have a plan for everyone. So why am I praying and tithing if there may be no plan for me? Um, that isn't what you said. I, I want to cons yeah. go back in, in time to what was asked me. It was a trick question. Somebody slipped in to try to embarrass me, and it said, if God has a plan for everybody, does he also have a plan for those billions of people that are suffering disease and suffering under, under uh, dictators? And that was the question. And the answer is, no, that's not God's plan. But I think we don't understand this whole thing of God's plan. What is it? Jesus said, I'm, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for those who believe? have believed on, on their word. And I do think there's a special relationship with those who know the Lord. And so your question is, you love God, you want to serve God, and a lot of what comes about is, quote, the plan of God. 
is what you do with things yourself. He's given you a mind. He's given you a spirit. He's given you a conscience. And he's given you opportunities. And out of that, you know, unto him who has more will be given. That's what the Bible says. So a lot of the, the plan you can work out yourself. We we'll leave you with today's power minute from the Psalms. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. Thank you for being.